Good morning. Once again, we're coming to you through the technology that is available and through YouTube, you get a chance to have some semblance of worship. But in my heart, I hear that verse that says, I was glad when they said unto me, Come, let us go into the house of the Lord. We look forward to that. Even now as they begin to talk about reopening the government, reopening uh, businesses, we're beginning to think with church leaders about reopening church. And um, your church ought to have some conversations about what reopening might look like. And while it's still a ways off, remember that when we go back to church, church will not be the way it was it will be different. And to think through how we're going to prepare for that is going to be a value to you, and it will make the transition easier. So as we look forward to the day when we shall be back together as a gathered community in one place, uh, please take time to pray, pray and discern what God is calling you to and where he's leading. This morning, we want to fix our minds again on Jesus Christ, and so we begin with a word of prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you for this day that you have made. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for the privilege of being called your children. Thank you so much that we live in a day and age when we can be separate and yet together. Lord, you know our heart's desires. We long to be a gathered community again. Until that time, we continue to ask you to give us patience, help us to bless and be a blessing to others, and that, Lord, this day, may your name be praised in our homes, as well as across the country and throughout the world, in the homes of brothers and sisters in Christ. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. For our call to worship this morning, we're going to talk about Doubting Thomas. So it's going to be based on John 20 verses 24 through 31. And normally this would be a responsive call to worship, but seeing as how Brad has to uh, keep his focus on recording this, I will do both the pastor's part and the congregational part. So for our call to worship, so let us gather this morning in our Father's holy name. Thomas said, Unless I see the mark of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Well, aren't we often skeptical people? Aren't we driven by our senses, relying on that which we can hear, that which we can see or prove? Our Lord asks us to see the invisible, to trust in the Spirit, and to have faith. Lord, give us faith. Sometimes we get carried away by our emotions, by wishful thinking, and by popular trends that pull us in. Lord, help us to be bold in our beliefs, but also to be as careful as Thomas was. Move us beyond mere trust in ordinary things and open our eyes to the spiritual realities. Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Amen. And now we'll have a song, Blessed Assurance, and once again, we ask that you join in wherever you may be seated or standing or walking around. Blessed Assurance.
Dear Lord, we find ourselves in the locked doors of ourselves, just as the disciples were behind closed doors. We too are afraid, perhaps for a different reason than theirs. But we too need to breathe the breath of the Holy Spirit to take away our fears so that we can come out from behind these locked doors. And dear Heavenly Father, we are like Thomas with our questions and our doubts. We sometimes need to see in order to believe. We need you in order to have faith. And dear Heavenly Father, we too need the peace that you bring because our world is full of violence and unrest. Just as Thomas confessed, you are his Lord and his God, we boldly claim that for our lives. We thank you for the blessing you are his. We thank you for the blessing you have given us, the ones who believe without seeing, Lord, may the doors of our churches be open to all and that doubters be welcome here. Amen. Let's continue with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now this would be the time that we collect the weekly tithes and offerings. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, those that are on envelopes, to continue sending your envelopes into the church, whichever church you may be attending, because once again, we need to remember that the churches need to be maintained. Now also, during this time, we should also uh, be given thanks for all the gifts and the talents that God has given each and every one of us. We are in a time of turmoil, confusion, but if you stop and you think, we have to give the good Lord our blessing because of what he has done to each and every one of us. How he has given us the opportunity to help our neighbors, to help those that are in need. It doesn't have to be the financial gifts which we receive. Look at all of the folks that are making masks. They're making your protective gear for all the health workers. Look at all of the other workers, the first responders. Look at those that are working in the grocery stores. And we see that we are get, being given the opportunity to exercise that kindness and that love which we are to show our neighbors as true Christians. So again, even though we ask for financial gifts, we need to remember that those other gifts are more valuable than the financial ones. So dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all which you have done for us, what you have given us, and for the opportunities to help all those in need. Now we're going to the pastoral prayer. And again, each of the churches have their own list. They have their prayer chains. I don't have access to all of that. So what we'll do is we'll take a couple of moments of silent prayer so that each church, each member, can take the time and send those prayers above. And then what I'll do is I'll go ahead and lead us in corporate prayer. So let's go ahead for a few moments, a silent prayer.
Now here at uh, China Baptist Church, we continue to pray for Pastor Ron, who is making some progress. Hopefully within a week, he may be able to come home and receive the services that he needs at home. We have Dorothy Hilt's family. Dottie, as she was called, passed away. So we need to keep her family in prayers as well. And also all those that are suffering from the coronavirus, those who are suffering due to family separations. And again, each church has their own list. So let's go to corporate prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, there are many among us today with special needs in their own lives and need your special touch and reassurance right now. There are numerous physical problems and we do not understand why these things come in our lives and we're very tempted to question, to question you and our faith. And we know at times it is tested to the max. We pray that you give each of us the patience so that our faith will not fail during these days. Some have family and relationship problems and they need special grace to see them through. Bring healing and reconciliation to them. We pray for the leaders of our nation today and the many important and critical situations they face. Give wisdom to our president and the cabinet members and the men and women in Congress. We pray for our military personnel stationed around the world. We know they face dangers and the possibility of death day after day. We pray for all the people on the front lines fighting the coronavirus. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Now, if you have young ones at home, or even teenagers, sitting there on the couch, or the recliner, or on the floor, keep them with you as we listen to Reverend Dr. Al Fletcher present the message. Thanks, David. And thanks again to the China Baptist Church uh, for Brad Bickford's uh, technical skills and for Donna Gorton's playing and for David Roderick helping me in the worship service and leading worship. Um, he talked about young folks at home. Uh, take out your Bibles this morning and turn to the 20th chapter. We'll look at verses 24 until 31, uh, seven verses. And uh, have your kids read along. Have them look at the scriptures as we read and uh, help them to get a sense of this grand uh, story, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. John writes in the 24th verse, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where his nails were, and put my hand into his side, I'll not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord, my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pause for a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word, which is a light unto our feet, a lamp unto our path, and we're so grateful that you have given to us insight and reason, so that as we read your word, your spirit begins to minister. And as your spirit minister, it takes words off the page 
and use them to transform our hearts into the very image of Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave us without a witness, but that you've given to us your word. For in it we see how men and women have walked with you and struggled with you and learned from you and gave themselves to you. Help us in the same way to give ourselves over and over again so that Christ may be seen to be our Lord and Savior. We ask that you might bless even the poor fallible words of a preacher, for we ask in your son's name. Amen. John concludes by saying these words were written so that you may believe. There were lots of other things that Jesus did and aren't recorded in the book. And part of the reason because it wasn't recorded is that the gospel is not simply a record of what Jesus did. It's not simply a historical record. Rather, the gospel is actually using the history of Jesus, using the, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, to tell a story. And the story that John tells in his gospel is a story that leads you to believe that Jesus Christ is both Lord and God. That Jesus Christ is the one who created the world and through him all things were made that have been made. Nothing that has been made has been made apart from Jesus Christ. He was there at the beginning. He will be there at the end. And as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, God joins us in the middle because man is without a beginning and without an end, but in Jesus Christ, he has a beginning, middle, and end. And that's the purpose of the Gospels. The Gospels are to help center the life of Jesus Christ in history so that you might see a beginning, a middle, and an end. In so doing, our story is cast in their story. And we begin to see Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and so we know who created the world, we know where the world will end, but more importantly, we know who will accompany us on our journey in this period of time that we have to walk across God's green earth. I want to begin by taking a quick look at uh, people. There are different kind of people that were represented in this story of the resurrection. The first people that were mentioned in the story were the disciples and Mary Magdalene. When Mary Magdalene poked her head into the, the tomb, she saw that Jesus was not there and ran and told Peter and John, they have taken the Lord. He's not there. On Mary's word, Peter and John ran to the tomb and they saw it, it was just as Mary had said and they believed. Sometimes that's the way Jesus Christ becomes Lord uh, among our friends. Sometimes our witness is credible enough that when we say to them, this is why I believe, and we give them reason to believe, we show them why we believe what we believe, they accept that testimony and come to believe it to be true. In some ways, that's my testimony. I grew up in a Christian home with Christian parents. And as I lived with them, I witnessed Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. And their testimony became my testimony. I saw the values that they had and came to determine that this Savior that they call Christ was to be my Savior. Because I saw in them truth. I saw in them love. I saw in them grace. I saw in them the fruits of the Spirit, and I wanted that for myself. And when they told me I needed to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, I was eager to do it. I didn't have questions. I simply took their testimony, just like Peter and John took Mary's testimony, and became a believer. He's risen. He's risen indeed. The second was Mary. Mary went inside the tomb and she even saw two angels sitting there and had a conversation with them. Something so surprising, something so different, something so out of the ordinary, and yet Mary was so grief-filled, so consumed by her own world, that she didn't realize the moment she was having. 
And Balaam was another one. Balaam was sent to curse Israel. And you remember the story of how Balaam was riding on his donkey and began to have a conversation with the donkey when the donkey refused to go toward Israel so that Balaam could curse it. Balaam carries on a conversation not realizing he's talking to a donkey. And I think there are people like that that God uses extraordinary things in their life, extraordinary circumstances, and they still don't understand what they've experienced. Sometimes that came about because of the circumstances of life. When I pastored the West Falmouth Baptist Church, I had a member of that church tell me that he went through World War II and some of the ugliest fighting battles in World War II, and time and time and time again, God spared his life. Although he would say, I didn't know God at that time. I didn't recognize his hand in my life. All I knew, it was a miracle that I wasn't killed. And while others around me were losing their lives, somehow miraculously, I made it through. He said, it wasn't until the birth of my first child that I came to know who God was. It was in that moment that all of those experiences during the war years came to be um, aware to me, became part of my testimony. Same thing with Mary, consumed by her own grief. It wasn't until Jesus spoke to her, it wasn't until he called her Mary, that the uh, eyes were opened and the heart was made whole. And so too for this fella, it wasn't until he saw the birth of his child that suddenly the scales fell off and he came to know Jesus Christ. It was one of those miracle moments, even though he had had miracles in his life for some time. There's another group, and that was the disciples themselves. That actually took a gathered experience. And there are many in churches today who will tell you that they came to know Jesus Christ because of being in a gathered group. They came to a church meeting and they heard the word of God spoken. And when they heard the word of God spoken, it was as if Jesus Christ was speaking personally to them. Sometimes it would be in a prayer meeting where they came in and they unburdened in their heart and in the midst of the heart unburdening as they heard the prayers being offered on their behalf, suddenly Jesus Christ spoke to them. This was a gathering in an upper room and all of a sudden Jesus appeared and in appearing he called them to faith and they believed. We come now to Thomas just another person. He's known as the twin. Uh, he's also known as one of the twelve. It's amazing because Thomas has had experience with Jesus Christ. He's had three years with him. Thomas has seen Jesus in feeding of the 5,000. Thomas was there when Jesus did his teaching about uh, going to the Father. And Thomas was the one who said, uh, we don't know where you're going. Lord, show us the way. Thomas was always that person who was like Joe Friday. He just wanted the facts. And he was a bit of a pessimist at times. When Jesus was talking to the disciples about going to Lazarus to raise him from the dead, going back to Jerusalem, Thomas was uh, pretty much a pessimist. If we go back to Jerusalem, we're going to die. But if he wants to go back and die, let's go with him and die. That's Thomas. So it's no wonder that Thomas in this moment says, I don't know what you folks heard last Sunday when you gathered. I'm not sure I understand exactly what experience you had. But I can tell you from personal experience, dead people don't rise and until I actually see him in front of me, until I put my finger into his wounds, my hand into his side, I'll not believe it. Jesus talked about faith like this. It was one of those 
teaching moments that he talked to the disciples, he said with scorn to the Pharisees, you always want a sign. You never just want to take it by truth. You never just want to take it on my word. You always want me to perform a sign. And the sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah. God spoke, and by faith they accepted it. If you don't accept it by faith. And so here we are. There's ample reason why Jesus should have never showed up on Sunday evening. He could have said, Thomas, you had three years. You know, all of that teaching, all of that time, what were you doing? Were you paying attention to anything I said? Was there anything there that I did that just kind of gave you some insight into who I was? Thomas, when I was teaching you about the Son of Man had to suffer and die and then rise again after the third day, did you think I was joking with that? Did you think, Thomas, that this was all for naught? I mean, come on, three years you had. Why did I waste my time? No, he doesn't say that. In fact, Jesus actually shows up. And he doesn't say to Thomas anything derogatory. But rather, he takes Thomas where he's at. Thomas, if it means for you to believe that you're going to have to stick your finger into my wounds and reopen them, do it. If it's going to mean that you're going to have to prove that I'm alive that way, then do it. Thomas, you are one of the twelve. Remember Jesus saying that he was the good shepherd who cared for his sheep? That he was the good shepherd who would leave the ninety and nine and go after the one that would go astray? Thomas is that sheep. Thomas is beginning to wander. And Jesus comes back because Thomas is important to Jesus. I want you to know that people are important to Jesus. The Old Testament tells us that the Savior, the true Savior, is a gentle Savior. A bruised reed he'll not break. A smoking flax he'll not quench. A faith of a mustard seed is what's required to transform lives from sinner to saint. To become part of the family of God. To be adopted in and brought in. And Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. And if one of his own disciples is struggling... It's worth everything to be there. Same greeting he gave the disciples last Sunday. Peace be with you. Thomas, through my wounds, I'm transforming the world. I went through death and came out the other side in order that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Thomas suffered to be so. When Thomas encounters the love of God in Christ, he cries out the greatest testimony in the Gospel of John. Throughout John, you'll find various disciples and various personalities referring to Jesus as Lord, Adonai, which is a high title. It was the title that was often used in the Old Testament when speaking about God, but not using his name directly. To allude to Adonai was to allude to godliness. And to say Adonai in the Old Testament was another way of saying God, but it was always carefully cloaked. Not for Thomas. Thomas says, my Lord Adonai and my God. In that moment, Thomas came to believe that Jesus Christ was the resurrected Lord, but also the God of heaven and earth. The one who created him and the one who has redeemed him. The one who has given to him life and given to him 
spiritual life. And then Jesus pronounces one of the greatest beatitudes. Blessed are those who believe and haven't seen. A lot of us understand that seeing is believing. But by faith, Jesus said, it's more blessed to believe and so to see. That's what happened on Easter for us. And that's what we're eyewitnesses of. That in Jesus Christ, I didn't have to see him with my physical eyes to know he's raised. I believe by the testimony of others that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and in so doing, I am now a witness of the resurrection. We know that in church on Sunday we sing hymns. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Uh, Christ the Lord is risen today. We sing hymns which talk about the person of Jesus Christ being alive and being present in our life. And the reason is, is because we have come to where Thomas came, to that moment of belief and decision, where Jesus Christ no longer was simply a figure in a history book, but Jesus Christ became our Savior and our Lord. We believe that he is risen and risen indeed, and we believe that he's coming again. John says the whole purpose for writing his book is so that you may believe and in believing have life in his name. My hope is that whoever you are listening to this uh, recording, if you don't know Jesus Christ, to ask him into your life so that you may come to know with assurance that he is the resurrected one. Jesus is not distant and far away. He's close. And he hears your prayers and he answers them. Just in the quiet moments of a home, you can ask Jesus Christ into your life as Savior and Lord. And in so doing, by believing in him, you're giving life. Not simply the life that you have now, but eternal life. A life that is meant to be lived out with God. And that life doesn't have to wait until the day you die to engage. The moment you accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That's the moment new life begins. Nothing would make our hearts any greater uh, for those of us who put this recording together than to know that someone today has made a decision for Jesus Christ and come to believe and so come to become a witness of the resurrection. May God's grace, mercy, and peace be with you. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you be with um, my brother and my sister as they sit and struggle. Some ways just like Thomas did, wanting to know with assurance that you are Lord. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you hear those prayers. And you give assurance. I pray today that you would give assurance in ways that is individual and personal. So that whoever is listening who wants to know you will come to know you in a way that only you could uh, make possible. And so we entrust them into your hands, Lord. For our brothers and sisters who are struggling, may they come to believe and to see. May they come to understand the wounds that you endured were for their benefit. And so, Lord, we pray, help us to be a blessing to others. For we ask it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. For our closing hymn, the wonder of it all.
Dear Lord, thank you that we are a family in Christ. Help us to share his love with everyone that we encounter this week. May we share Christ's abounding goodness upon our families, our friends, and our neighbors. May we be your hands and feet to the needy, your words of affirmation to the oppressed, and your arms of comfort to the lonely. Thank you for choosing to use us to bring your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Now next week is Communion Sunday. So when you gather next week to watch the service, please have a piece of bread and some wine. God bless.